Alright, so this lecture is going to deal with D.W. Griffith, certainly one of the most enigmatic characters in film history. If we were to put together a list of the most important filmmakers of all time, that list would probably begin with D.W. Griffith, the man to whom we owe the most in the development of cinematic narration. Now throughout this presentation, I'm going to be referring to and using a lot of words that we're taking up in chapter two of our text, specifically beginning on page 33 with a section that is called the beginnings of the continuity system. In last class, I'm certain that I covered the first sentence of that section, and I'll quote it here for you. When editing links a series of shots narrative clarity will be enhanced if the spectator understands how the shots relate to each other in space and time. Again, that sentence, what it really means for us is that the clarity, the ease with which we watch a film move in time and space is made much more clear when those shots are edited together in a logical, linear, continuity fashion. So again, this section is called the beginnings of the continuity system, that what later in the semester we're going to call the invisible style. D.W. Griffith contributes to this style more than anyone else through the first part of the 20th century. As you'll also read in your text on the section of D.W. Griffith specifically, it's page 58 through 60, you'll see that Griffith made hundreds and hundreds of one real and two real films, short films lasting no more than 20 minutes, throughout the first 10 years of the 20th century. Then, with 1914's release of The Birth of a Nation, Griffith had concretized the basics of cinematic grammar. He's also, straight up, one of the most enigmatic characters. He is the film, Birth of a Nation, the one which will pay the most attention today is overtly racist. Indeed, while watching certain clips from this film, it will not be difficult to see that racism. Simultaneous to this is notoriety that he gained with developing cinematic grammar. So today we're going to take a look at that, how that began specifically uh, for D.W. Griffith. Working at the Biograph Picture Company, D.W. Griffith produced hundreds of one reeler films, again those films lasting under 20 minutes. At this same time, Griffith was working with the production company to make longer movies, what he believed could fill a night's entertainment. So when we, if you were to watch the entirety of Birth of a Nation, you'd be sitting there for well over three hours and 20 minutes. I'm not going to have you do that here, but we are going to look at several clips that exemplify the style that Griffith developed during these biograph years and then so forcefully put forth in Birth of a Nation. So there are two main aspects that contribute to cinematic grammar of continuity, specifically when talking about the style and error. Remember, obviously, sound in the future is going to contribute significantly to cinematic grammar, that is, the ways in which you perceive movies and their stories. But right now with D.W. Griffith, there are really two. The first is inter-frame narration. And we'll note that these issues that I'm about to highlight have to do with editing. The second contributing aspect of cinematic grammar referred to intra-frame narration. Intraframe narration refers to issues of mise-en-scene and cinematography. So back to interframe narration. First aspect that we uncovered when we were reading pages 33 and following in the beginnings of the continuity system in our textbook. One of the most significant issues that these early filmmakers, these storytellers had to, de had to deal with, concern the ability to maintain consistency and continuity in terms of screen direction and time so that the viewer would not be confused as to the action happening on screen. So take this as an example. A film we're showing you a car traveling in this direction, holding that shot for 
five seconds, and then showed you a train in another shot traveling in this direction. They showed that shot for five seconds or so, and then they showed you the car, and then they showed you the train, and then they edited the car, and then the train, and then the car, and then the train, and then all of a sudden you saw this, you would be very, very confused. You would have thought, given the first shot of the car and the first shot of the train, that they were headed towards one another. And yet, in the next shot, we see that the car is actually trying to race past the train. This is confusing. Maintaining screen direction would require that the camera stay on the same side of the car in the first shot, and the same side of the train in the next shot, so that we could see them collide. So, then edit together with greater speed, we can easily recognize the ways in which dramatic tension is increased. Indeed, it's adding to the clarity that this train is going to crush this car. To this phenomena, we give the name accelerated montage. By decreasing shot length, we tend to increase dramatic tension within the frame. Think of the opening of the latest Batman movie, how frenetically paced it is. In fact, check out any Christopher Nolan movie and you'll see that by keeping the editing at working at such a pace in certain scenes in the films, he's able to increase the tension within that frame. That is, it's not always what you are seeing, but how you are seeing that matters in the unfolding of a story. This is so given to you, this is so logical to you, that you don't even see those edits. You know exactly how that film would look. That is logic, and is linear, and it is clear. To this ability to maintain consistency of screen direction, we give the name the 180 degree system. Specifically, we call this line that the camera will not cross the axis of action. Let's look at it this way. If we have a two shot, what we would call a mid shot, as you see this shot contains half of the bodies of the people we're looking at here, and then I start to edit closer to that shot, and I edit from person A to person B. This is standard stuff. You see this on television and commercials, etc. To render this invisibly, that is, so that the viewer does not see any of the edits that happen, I have to maintain screen continuity, obeying the 180 degree rule. You see here that also we can see from the bird's eye view where the camera would be placed in order to get both our establishing shot, our shot, and our reverse shot of that. Now, once D.W. Griffith has this rule established as, par, as a way to maintain screen direction, he recognizes that now he can edit from different camera setups to create image sentences by alternating the distance that his camera is from its filmed objects. So now Griffith is free to edit around in time and space in a way that feel, people like Georges Méliès in Trip to the Moon were unable to. Recall that on those notes, we noted that Georges Méliès links together scenes, not individual shots. There are no edits within those individual scenes. So as you go to the film clips that I'm going to link you to in just a moment, see if you can't recognize ways that D.W. Griffith maintains screen direction by obeying the 180 degree rule, or the ways in which he alternates the distance that the camera is to its filmed object. Similarly, when watching those clips, pay attention to how he links together different times and spaces, bringing together scenes that are happening in different locales, and then edits in such a way as to bring them together. We call this cross-cutting, editing between different times and spaces, editing them in such a way as to make it seem linked together. For the greatest example of this, I ask you to watch the closing scene from the first Godfather film, what many people refer to as the baptismal scene from 1970s. We see Francis Ford Coppola perfectly obeying the rules written down some 60 or so years prior with D.W. Griffith.
So you should recognize that the last four elements we've talked about have all dealt with interframe narration or issues of editing. Now we turn our attention to intraframe narration. I know this might be difficult to believe, but D.W. Griffith was one of the first filmmakers to recognize that acting for the camera was dramatically different from acting on screen. For the first 15 or so years of cinema's history in the United States, we were making our movies just as if we were filming a play being acted on a stage in front of us. So for D.W. Griffith, acting begins to matter, and acting that is much different for the camera. He also recognized that he could use lighting in expressive ways. He could express emotions, he could express interiority, that is, feelings from the inside, the way a character felt, by using lighting in expressive ways. Think of any shot of, of some little girl who is helplessly trapped by the bad guy. Regularly, we would hit her with extremely soft light so as to accentuate her innocence. You can still see this played out today in any television commercial for women's hair care products. Think of the girl massaging her hair with the shampoo and then showing you after she's dried it. And she seems to glow, radiate somehow at the end of her hairs. In the silent air, this is pulled off by the use of expressive lighting, soft lighting, in addition to soft focus. Now, of course, we just open it up into a computer and manipulate it to look however we want it to. Griffith also recognized that he could use lighting to manipulate time. For example, by having a lamp outside of a window of a scene, he can move that lamp in certain ways to suggest the passage of the sun across the sky. Similarly, he also recognizes that by moving the camera within the scene, again, not by editing, but by act moving that camera, by traveling with it, tracking, panning, or tilting, he activated audiences' participation, giving a sense of new mobility to the cinema. Can you imagine a Christopher Nolan movie in which the camera did not move? Well, Griffith recognized that the camera's movement incorporates the spectator more in the unfolding of the action, almost making it seem as if you are there. So now I want to take you through several scenes of Birth of a Nation to show you how some of these elements play out. All of the time, make sure that you're considering that people who first watched this film in 1915 were not schooled in cinematic grammar the way that you and I are. They were the first generation to learn how images could be put together into continuity form. You and I take that for granted so much that we don't even pay attention to how we are given the stories that we love.
I have to say I'm pretty proud of you for making it all the way through that. There's a little added bonus for having watched the entire thing. I'm going to check out this next still that I'm going to show, the last thing on this video, uh, for a graded quiz in your breakout section next time. All right, and I'll see you next week.